Hello, everyone. I'm beginning a new series on YouTube dealing with Bible prophecy. I guess a long title might be Bible Prophecy and Its Interpreters Through the Ages, and maybe a subtitle, When Prophecy Fails. So what happens when those interpretations don't work out? What do people do? What do the interpreters do? Do they reinterpret? Do they make excuses? Do they claim that the prophecy that they had interpreted was actually fulfilled? Do they just throw everything away and give up? I want to take a look at that. That phenomena scholars call when prophecy fails. And I also want to deal with why prophecy fails. And by that, I mean, I want to look at the texts that people are using, all of the texts, all the major texts that people use when they try to interpret what the Bible says about the future. And what's the nature of those texts? And what's going on within the texts? And is there something about a historical look at those texts in their own time and in their own context that could shed light on this whole enterprise of interpreting Bible prophecy now for probably 2,500 years or so that it's been going on. So this in some ways is a sequel to my previous series, What the Bible Says About Death, Afterlife, and the Future. But I want to specifically zone in on this idea of predicting the end of the age and what goes on with that whole enterprise. I've taught a course now for years that I've called The End of the World as We Know It. And one of the things I say to the students the first day, and I don't mean it cynically or sarcastically, we are beginning the study of an activity, an enterprise, a phenomenon that so far has a 100% failure rate. Now, I know that many hearing this would say right away, and it's a fair point, certainly should be discussed, that well, Bible prophecy never fails, it's the people that interpret it that have failed because they've been wrong in their interpretations. And certainly if we went to the latest interpretation of Bible prophecy on YouTube, and there are quite a few out there, if you would dare search for end of the world, Bible prophecy, book of Revelation, mark of the beast, any of these kind of key terms that people are using all the time for Bible prophecy, you'd find lots of people that would say just that. Yes, they've all been wrong, but now I've got the truth. So I think the why prophecy fails is just as important to look at the texts and see what their nature is and see what we can learn and what kind of light we can shed upon the whole. So let me give you a little idea of what I have in mind in this new series, just a sort of an overview. I want to begin with the Dead Sea Scrolls right here. Got an English copy, the complete Dead Sea Scrolls in English. And I have a course coming out on the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's called Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls that will be released in September. But this will be focusing in on the phenomena of what were their prophetic views. And I'm actually going to call it the first Messiah. I'm taking that from a book title published by Michael Wise, a colleague and a friend of mine, in which he argues that the teacher of righteousness, that figure in the Dead Sea Scrolls, is in fact our first documented Messiah in history. And I want to give that full attention. I want us to look at some of the passages. And guess what? The prophetic interpretations of the teacher and his community all fail to come about. And so we want to examine that. We want to kind of track the phenomena of when prophecy fails and why it fails and how people deal with the disappointment. I then want to go to Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, who records the life and career of 11 Messiah figures other than Jesus. 
He includes Jesus in a disputed passage that we will discuss, but there are 11 others. You've probably heard of some of them, Judas the Galilean, and a couple of them are even mentioned in the New Testament. Another one is named Thutis. And usually he doesn't give a very complete account of them, but by what he says, we're able to actually put together little profiles of each one of them. And I want that to be a way of talking about what was it about the late Second Temple period in the first century that caused this incredible wave of messianic expectation, prophecy, and, I might add, disappointment. I can tell you what happened to every one of these messiahs. They were all killed, some beheaded, some crucified. They met various fates, and they were all put out of the way by the various Jewish and Roman authorities, Jesus being, of course, the best known. Now, in the case of the Jesus movement, I want us to look at what we can say about earliest Christianity seen as an apocalyptic movement in those decades of the first century when all these other messianic claimants are arising. In other words, to give it a kind of a context. So we do want to look at the Jesus apocalypse that's in Mark 13. Got two other versions of it, but Mark 13 is the original. I want us to look at Paul because he's our earliest witness to the Jesus movement and his letters and the things he says about apocalypticism. I want us to look at the book of Revelation, which essentially becomes a kind of Christianized interpretation of the book of Daniel. And then I think I'll go to the second century CE and certainly talk about the time of Hadrian and the Bar Kokhba revolt, because we have some really interesting first-hand documented material from caves down along the western side of the Dead Sea, a couple of letters actually written by Bar Kokhba himself, if you can imagine, and that would be around the year 132 through 135 to talk about that, but also the apostolic fathers, as they're called, what do they say about the end? Is the hope beginning to fade? Have they learned their lessons about failed expectations as they get further and further away from the different predictions that were made earlier in the time of Vespasian, Nero, Domitian, and some of the things we find in the New Testament? I want to look at the Didache, which has a whole chapter on the last days, and basically just recast what everybody had been saying for 100 years, even though it had failed to come about. And then I want to look at the Montanists. This is in the late second century, an amazing movement that took place that lots of people maybe have never heard of. And then I want to do a few selected church fathers that do deal with prophecy and Bible prophecy. And some of them even try their hand at predicting some chronology for the end and calculating some of the numbers of the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation any of you that have delved into Bible prophecy will know about the 1260 days, the 1290 days, the 1335 days, the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel 9 and so forth and so on. Well, some of the church fathers deal with that. And then to look at a movement that we sometimes call amillennialism, which basically argues that the church is the kingdom and none of the prophecies have really failed. It has a modern kind of reincarnation and what lots of people call the full preterist movement, but it definitely goes back to antiquity where Augustine and others would argue that the church is the kingdom, that it's been established, that all the prophecies of the Bible have largely been fulfilled, except in some cases holding out the idea of a final second coming of Christ and resurrection of the dead. And there are different variations of that preterist view. And then I want to go to another book written by Norman Cohen, published in 1957, with the great fantastic title, The Pursuit of the Millennium. And 
Norman Cohen deals mainly with movements in the Middle Ages. And then we'll move into our own time, um, 100, 150 years ago. I'll probably focus more on American kinds of predictions because that's what I'm most familiar with. The Millerite movement in the 1840s, for sure, we want to take a look at that and how the prediction of the second coming of Christ motivated thousands and thousands of people to expect it on a certain day and a certain time and a certain hour. And you may never have looked at the numbers behind that because they're actually pretty impressive and quite interesting. If someone made them today in a similar way about the 2000s into our own century, I think they'd get quite a few followers. But of course, what they most expected to happen did not happen. However, in dealing with it, Ellen G. White, who's usually credited with being the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, she claimed that Miller was right, but he was wrong about what he expected. But his numbers were right. And as far as I know, the Seventh-day Adventists still hold to that interpretation. So that'll get into kind of the idea of when prophecy fails. And then I want to go to Charles Taz Russell, the late 19th century Bible student who founded a movement that he called Bible students. They still exist today. I've met some of them and even studied with some of them and learned about some of their views. And Russell did predict the end several times. The most well-known is 1914 about the coming of Christ, the famous phrase, millions now living will never die worked its way into the subsequent movement that credits Russell in some ways as their founder, although I don't think Russell would accept that designation. Uh, I want to do Herbert W. Armstrong. If you know the 1940s, 50s, 60s, he was the most prominent voice over the radio and finally television all the way up into the 1970s with millions and millions of people all over the world in many languages. And he began during the height of World War II, watching Adolf Hitler and movements in the Middle East. And there was lots of other interest at the time, and we'll use Herbert Armstrong to introduce that. Some of you might know the booklet that Herbert Armstrong published, 1975 in Prophecy, he later said that that wasn't a date that he set, but within the movement, it clearly was a date that many were looking to, but that is quite a booklet. I have a copy of it, and when I go into that, I will talk about the booklet and maybe put up some of the illustrations that Basil Wolverton did that many of you will remember. And then there's Hal Lindsey of the 1970s, another book, The Late Great Planet Earth. What a title all-time bestseller of the decade. I think it sold more than any book other than the Bible. What Hal Lindsey basically did was he took an interpretation of the 19th century that goes back to John Darby in England, and he popularized it. It had been spread pretty widely through the Schofield Bible that was published with the notes and it's usually referred to by scholars as dispensationalism. But Lindsay took that and just really put it on the road so that today it is the dominant interpretation of Bible prophecy, this kind of dispensationalist, antichrist, uh, final three and a half years, secret rapture, who will be left behind, final judgment, millennium, and so forth and so on. We'll look at all of that. One of the major things that Hal Lindsey did and made really widespread and popular was his focus on the state of Israel established in 1948, and particularly the Six-Day War when the old city of Jerusalem came once more under Jewish sovereignty for the first time since 70 CE or AD when the Romans destroyed the city. And that became very, very major so that Lindsay's views and his interpretation 
of the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, and the whole scenario of how we're near the end of the age has unfolded and reached just hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. Uh, at the end of that kind of run through history, uh, I'm going to pick a few things on YouTube, probably the good, the bad, the ugly, and the crazy, uh, where people have interpreted Bible prophecy in various ways and just do a little bit of an evaluation of some of the interpretations are out there. For example, since the tragedy of 9-11 and the rise of certain kinds of Islamic fundamentalist groups, which, by the way, have their own prophetic interpretations and have begun to say that the Antichrist, as he's been called, will be a Muslim, whereas Hal Lindsey was quite sure that it would be a kind of revival of a European power and a figure something like Adolf Hitler. So we'll take a look at that, and then we'll go to the why. So I don't know. And then we'll go to the why. Why do prophecies fail? Why have they failed through the ages? And I want to take a hard look at the texts that are used. I want us to look at the book of Daniel. I want us to look at the book of Revelation. And I also want us to look at the actual texts that could be called messianic prophecies in the Hebrew Bible particularly, because those are the prophecies that are used by people even today to argue that Jesus, for example, is the Messiah and the assertion that he's fulfilled hundreds of these prophecies. Well, there are 10 basic texts on the Davidic Messiah, and we'll look at all 10, and we'll have to ask the question, did Jesus or anyone else ever fulfill any of these yet? And notice I said yet, because Christians believe that those that he hasn't fulfilled yet, he will fulfill in the future. And then there are different interpretations of how Jesus is going to fulfill those. And as I mentioned earlier, there are people that call themselves full preterists that say that Jesus has fulfilled every single prophecy of the Hebrew Bible, and there's nothing else left. And maybe we'll close with that view, because that's a pretty uh, all-compassing view, and talk about it a little bit. So I hope you'll uh, look forward to this series and follow it. Uh, I think it's going to be of great interest to people, and I'll begin it uh, early next week with the first Messiah taking a look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. Take care, everyone.